sometimes you can put a limit order way, way, way above the market and somebody is stupid enough to buy it and push it higher. But let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology and action. So we have a new mystery chart this week. This is a relatively new issue, AKA an IPO. Notice that it began to take off nicely. It has a bigger picture cup and handle look to it. I usually don't like stocks with at high level cup and handles, but this is a, an IPO. And uh, the high level ones I don't like a lot just because you have a bit of a double top happening. Whereas if they're coming off of major lows, uh, in this this case, it's all time lows and it's an IPO. So I, I like actually like the pattern. Uh, but anyway, nice, nice uh, Landry light, as you can see, illustrated uh, below and then a pullback to the moving average. Remember, this just measures the number of bars of Landry light, not the magnitude. So right here, you can see quite a few bars were below that 30. What's the general rule we talk about almost every week? Never buy any stock that is trading below 30 EMA. You're welcome, or crypto for that matter. But anyway, Landry Light goes to zero the moment you intersect the moving average. In this case, we're using the 30-day exponential moving average. Anyway, nice little pullback to the moving average. Entry is here, stop is down here. An additional profit target is up here, and I'll follow up with this one, obviously, in upcoming webinars. By the way, everything that I like to show you trade-wise is something that I've done uh, I've showed you before I actually did it. In the case of the mystery charts, those come straight from my trading service. You can look at the archives at davelander.com slash archives. The crypto trades, sometimes I do them live in the webinar, which I did a few weeks back. If I see something I really like, I'll uh, fire up a trade. And in more recent times, I've been posting them to the Facebook group, just so that uh, there's no hindsight involved with any of this that I show. I mean, anybody could have a uh, hundred losing trades and one winner and show you the winner like, see, look how easy it is. Anyway, this is CLOV. This is a former mystery chart. I'll go through it pretty quickly since we talked about it quite a bit. It was first recommended on August 28th and those were the parameters there. And you can see you have nice slanger light, little kiss of the moving average, but that's okay because it, it held the moving average. And then it began to accelerate higher. And that's a pattern I call accelerating momentum strategy. And I have a lot of different variations of a pullback, but when you boil it all down, they're just pullbacks, right? And then I pull back to the moving average. You can see the Landry light goes from 20 something in here down to zero, again, because you intersect the moving average. And entry was here, stop was here, initial profit target was here. Now, one thing I was shown with this position showing the ups and downs. And one thing I'm, I'm getting into a lot lately is showing you what trend following is all about and how it's a lot harder than it looks on the surface, but it can be done, especially if you're willing to do nothing and not watch every tick and get too excited about the ups or downs. But anyway, we got in a position within a few days, we were up $400 and then about a week or so later, we were down $360. And I know a lot of people gave up on it and bailed then. And truth be told, maybe I would too, would have too, had I just been trading this on my own maybe years ago before I actually had a trading service where at the trading service, I tell you what I'm going to do and then I'm forced to actually do it, which is a great, what they call a commitment device. And maybe next week, if I haven't, I don't know if I've already mentioned or not, but for many little things, we could talk about commitment devices. And I have a few stories there that I beat the dead horse on. Imagine that, me beating a dead horse. <laughs> anyway, a few days later, two days later, we're up $2,000. At that point, that's the IPT, the initial profit target. We bank half of our profits. So we sell half of our shares, no questions asked. And we do that intraday, meaning that. If it spikes to that level, you want to get out. You don't want to sit around and wait to see if it's going to close there. There is a little discretion we occasionally use. Sometimes you can squeeze out a little more profits. In this case, if you go back and look at the actual trades that are reported from my model account in this one, go back a few weeks in the week of charts, you'll notice that I didn't quite get that $1,000 in the first low. And that's because it kept getting close to four and backing off, close to four, backing off. And then I got the things like, you know, the real money is in the second low. And that's that's the way I kind of look at things. And then it did end up closing above the IPT and hitting it and closing above it. 
or add at least. So that were it would have worked out without discretion. So I made a few less dollars, I think fifty dollars less on that half of the trade. I did take it across multiple accounts, so I did okay on this. Don't worry about me. <laughs> or this one at least. You have to worry about some of that bad behavior that I'm always talking about. Because I can't occasionally be guilty. When the initial profit target is hit, you bump that stop up to break even and now you're free rolling and barring overnight gaps you have the chance of a free position and a potential home run now i may have jinxed this because earlier today this thing was up like 30 cents and on a four dollar stock that's a huge move so we were up 17 10 and remember we already banked a thousand this is on a hypothetical 100k account although i do actually have what is it a thousand shares left on on whatever that little Things said earlier, you buy 2,000 shares in this particular case because it was a one point stop. Now, even ludicrous would say that's kind of a wide and ludicrous stop, but that's what it called for. If you squint your eyes, $2 is right here and the stock is right there. It's not that far away. And as I've said quite a bit, people get really tripped up on high percentage stops, but if a stock is bouncing around 10 to 15% a day, then you're going to have to have your stop well out of that normal volatility and range, something I preach quite often. In fact, as I also preach, if you're having trouble becoming a successful and consistent trader, trade at a much, much, much smaller size and loosen your stops a lot, okay? And then that way, eventually, you'll catch some nice trends. And I'm going to show the importance of that. I kind of backed into something that I'm going to show you in a few minutes, uh, the importance of catching that occasional home run and how trend following does eventually work, provided you don't give up in the meantime. But anyway, we're in longer term trend following mode on the second loaf. Remember the first loaf, okay, with 2,000 shares, buy them all at once. In other cases, if it's a much wider stop or higher price issue, whatever the case may be. Anyway, it's, it all it's all based on the stop. So I guess at a higher price issue, the stop could be farther away on a point basis, which would make the stop smaller. So let me just kind of close that loop on that by saying that. So if it's a higher price stock and it's a, it's a fairly volatile stock, like I like to trade, then that stop will probably be like, let's say like 10 points away. When a 10 point stop, you would only trade, I think 200 shares if my math in my head is right, on a trade like that. Whereas this case, we're only using one point stop, so that's 2,000 shares. And by the way, as I've said quite often, when you can get into these issues at a relatively low price, now this stock was a stock that was much higher than this, and it came down and bottomed out nicely. And kind of like the coal company that we rode forever, and I think Jeff's still in it, he's here tonight. We rode it up, and at one point we were up 500%, and, and the, the point gains on that and the dollar gains were huge because we got it around five bucks a share, and it ran up like to 20, 30 bucks, whatever it was. So if you can catch a big winner, and I'm not saying you want to bottom fish, obviously you want to trade momentum like we're doing here, but this stock was at a relatively low level, and sometimes those can make some wonderful trades that last a long, long time. Let's hope. But anyway, we're in longer term, again, in longer term trend following mode. And we begin to let that stop gradually loosen up to, to more of a, a longer term trend following type of methodology. Uh, longer term trend following, drawdowns are abysmal, and I'll show you an example of that in just one second. And your accuracy is going to be very low, but as you'll see in a second too, I said I wasn't going to tell you, I was going to tell you, just going to tell you. <laughs> Uh, but the again, the drawdowns are abysmal and accuracy is low, but one good trade can pay for it all. Spoiler alert. All right, here's a live crypto trade update. I'd forgotten I made this trade a few weeks ago in the weekend charts, and there's the actual trade. Now, keep in mind with these shit coins, S-H-Y-T, I'm just trading at a small size, and I'm having a lot of fun with this. And the moment my size gets a lot, lot bigger, it'll probably be a lot harder to trade. But I don't think you need to put a lot of money in crypto. But I, I think that it's worth trading on a very small basis. My bread and butter 
will probably always be stocks. But if I could pick up a little here and there and apply some of this technical analysis thing to crypto, then why not? I'm also playing a little game where I'm mining off a little bit and from the shit coins and putting it to Bitcoin. So from crap becomes something that's, I hate to say tangible, but a slightly, slightly more real. Anyway, the entry was here. And this is just a, a just a generic type of pullback type of pattern. And let me see if we can back the chart out a little bit. You can see it was in a very persistent trend here. You can see it, it was accelerating and then it pulled back. So just kind of a generic type of pullback, nothing too fancy there. And I only put a thousand dollars into it, you know, just S and G type of stuff. And entered there uh, in the week of charts. You can go back and watch it. So what day was that? That was the way we're dating here. Yeah, on the third. So that was two weeks ago. And it looks like it was uh, toward the end of the week of charts, 6.48 my time. And that's when we uh, take a look at crypto and we take a look at um, stocks. But anyway, so far so good. I'll trail a stop on the remainder and we'll see what happens. And as I said a second ago, I mined off 25 bucks. I put in a little bit extra to allow for commissions too. And as I've said a thousand times, of course, the nerd in me, I looked into mining way too late just to think, you know, I could plug a couple of uh, servers into the garage or in the back of my office and let them just make some free money for me while I sleep and while I work all day too. And then I realized that it's probably not worthwhile doing. And I tried other experiments where I kept a little money in the native coin, just a small amount, and that failed miserably. So what I started doing is when I hit the IPT in these, I peel off a little bit, like a tiny bit, and put it in Bitcoin. I was using much bigger numbers for a while, and it was making it was making the math hard to work on the on the trading. The other thing I'll do is if something hits a double, I'll mine off a little bit of a double. And sometimes if they make a big spike higher, like there's one earlier spiked higher and I missed it because I wasn't paying attention, but sometimes you can put a limit order at way, way, way above the market and somebody is stupid enough to buy it and push it higher. That's, that's what the greater fool is. We are greater fool hunters. We want somebody more stupid than we are to come along and buy the trade. We're searching for the greater fool and we can, Call them the greater fool because sometimes we are the greater fool. Anybody ever buy the high tick of the market? <laughs> of course you have, right? I may have done that earlier today. Anyway, uh, quick update on the TFM 10% system. Again, here are the zones which were inspired by Jeff, who's here tonight. Initially, I just had a 10% line in here, 10% from the 50 week closing high. And I don't know why I use 50 week other than I was using a 50 week moving average. Maybe I just wanted everything to be same number. That's the rules to sell. The designer's intent, as I'll flesh out in just one second, was to get out of the way and hopefully avoid what Ian McActiffy used to call the diaper change moments. I borrowed that term from him. But anyway, you just need to close 50. 10% or more away from the 50 week closing high and close below the 50 simple moving average. I have plenty of YouTubes on that on my YouTube channel. By the way, I'm, I never remember to say like and subscribe. If you're liking this video, then like it. And if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. Well, I tell you, <laughs> YouTube took away the don't like. And then you'll watch a video and be like, what? This sucks. <laughs> you know, it used to be like you'd see like two likes and 3,000 dislikes, and you're like, okay, I know that that's probably some bad information, you know? <laughs> anyway, that's the sell, pretty simple rules, and you can see right there, close below 10%, the buy line, the 10% line, and uh, below the 50-week moving average. The buys are a little bit more stringent. You have to close within 10% of the 50-week closing high and have two bars of Landry light. It means lows greater than the moving average, bar one, bar two, so this was the last buy there. And not going wood so far, so good. It's been a pretty good run. The sell would be a close below that 10% line, or the 10% away from the 50 week closing high, and below the moving average again. So I don't want to get into it, but it did anyway. Uh, one thing I've been watching lately is the, the zones are now moving nicely higher. So you have to make a new 52 week 
closing high for the zones to move higher. So that's just kind of a neat thing. And maybe there's some sort of um, experimenting you could do with that as far as a system in and of itself. But you can see it flattens out every now and then, then begins to take off. By the way, the 5% the reason I had that in was because Jeff pointed out he likes to get out of a market when he's down 5%. And that's keep in mind that because you know, somebody was uh, there's somebody that's a fan of this on Twitter, and I was showing the the 230 EMA system triggered recently on Bitcoin, but it had a lot of overhead supply, and he's like, well, why not use just use the TFM 10 percent system? Well, I've experimented with it, but in a super volatile market like Bitcoin, you know, maybe once it matures, which it's slowly maturing, obviously. It becomes more and more efficient, like the S&P 500 or the Qs or even the Russell, which you'll see in one second. Then something like this might work, but I think your stop would have to be so darn wide that it's probably it would be probably hard to make it work. So this system was originally designed. Designer's intent is very important, by the way. But designer's intent on this was a system to use in the S&P 500 to keep you out of trouble when things turn south. Anyway, for s and as I've said, ad nauseum, I bought 100 shares of the Qs, and so the sell would be way down there around 440. It would have to close 10% away or more from the 50-week closing high and the 50-week moving average. Now, as I say weekly, if your moving average is above your, your sell line, it has to still close below the sell line. The 50-week moving average is just a whipsaw filter. Because sometimes you may get a spike down in a market and come right back up. And the reason I use a 50-week simple moving average is, believe it or not, I wanted to incorporate some lag into the system so you're not in and out like the like the rat going for the cocaine. I don't like cocaine, but I like the way it smells. Uh, I think that's a little old, but it's somewhere around sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars. I forgot to update that part of the slide. Now, here's the deal: as I've said quite a bit, if you're following a pure trend-following system, the drawdowns are going to be abysmal. And I didn't intend this to be a pure trend-following system. I just wanted something again to help me avoid some of those diaper change moments like the pandemic, the market completely ignored the pandemic. And then all of a sudden the market's like, oh shit, we better get out, you know? And so all of a sudden everybody's running for the exit at the same time and the system triggered a sell. By the way, I'm just noticing this, but notice that we almost went below this 10% level here. And again, it would also have to close below that moving average, which in this case was a ways away from it. But notice that the moving average has caught up to the the sell line or the I call it the sell line, the buy line, the 10% line. Okay. And you know what's interesting, I was just thinking about this right before I went live. At that point in time, you gave up nearly 80% of the gains that you had from this trend signal back here. And if you were to stop out way down here, you could possibly almost end or come very close to giving up 100% and maybe even a, a losing trade. So pure trade following, again, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal and you are going to risk a lot of money. And this was the, this was a little bit more painful one. And as I say each week, when I put this on, it was just S&G, it's 100 shares, who cares, right? But then all of a sudden it's like, holy crap, I just lost $4,500. And then holy crap, I just lost $8,000. It's like, wait a minute. But I'm just going to follow it and see what happens. And I don't recommend following mechanical systems. But if you're newer to trading, that might be one way to get your reps in, find something that's somewhat mechanical. And maybe even better is find something like persistent pullbacks, especially with like combined with something like Landry Light pullbacks, where you're pulling back to the moving average. So it's fairly quantifiable. And then you can look for other things in there, uh, make it a little subjective analysis too. But get get a little closer to that mechanical trading and then slowly add on layers of discretion from there and trade small, loosen your stops. You got to get the reps in. And I'll beat the dead horse on that quite a bit. 
I'll show you why I'm showing the Russell in, in just one second. So I, I thought I would take a look at this and, and the long story endless, which we'll get to the long story in one second. There was a gentleman who was was wanted to sell his Russell shares, and I'm like, well, why don't you wait for a TFM 10% sell signal? Now the Russell's a little wide and loose, and I started noodling with it a little while ago, earlier today, I should say, and I didn't I didn't mechanically test it, but just eyeballing it, I think it's it's it would probably work longer term, as I'll show you a few things here, in just one second, but I would prefer something that trades a little bit more cleanly, like the Qs or the P's. But anyway, you can see there was a buy here, a sell here. And I added that up. That was a 20.33 20 point, 20 cent loss. And then there was a buy there and then a sell there. So you had two back to back losing trades. And then you had a buy here. And if you mark that to market, as I did earlier, at 225, that's a 31. You're, you have 31.28 of open profits. Now we don't know where it's going to end up. But it would be kind of fun to watch. So we add all that up, and you're actually now positive with this system. Not by a lot, but if this thing goes up another 10, 20, 30 points, then it might begin to add up. Now, I'm not recommending you you trade this system here, but the reason I wanted to bring it up is you should have some sort of system to trade. You can't just trade based on your feelings or your mood. I saw somebody had a post in one of the trade forums. Trade the market, not your mood, or the market's mood, not your own. I'll have to flesh that out. But anyway, it reminded me of Aunt Dakota's Whipsaw song, and I actually attended a concert with left with uh, Ed Dakota, and it wasn't actually a concert. He just brought his banjo, and he gave a little speech at uh, one of our AAPTA meetings. And the whipsaw song, it's he talks about you get a whip and I get a saw, you get a whip and I get a saw. And you basically, you get whipsaw, whipsaw, whipsaw. And it's like, don't worry about that because one big trend pays for them all. Easier said than done. I get it. I know that. So very important takeaway there. And this is a screenshot this, or you know what, better yet, just do a YouTube on it and listen to the song. And it's pretty good. You know, what do you do with a hot news flash, honey? We stash that we stash that flash right in the trash. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do when drawdown comes, honey? What do you do when it get if it gets real big, baby? What do you do when it when it's even bigger? We stick to the plan and pull the trigger. The pandemic is is my recent reference point. Whenever I'm looking at anything and how it performs, and it makes for a great reference point. But you can see we had a sell in the Russell way back in October. 2019 or 2018, okay? And there was a sizable sell-off there. It wasn't a huge sell-off, but it sure would have been nice to be out of the market for that sell-off. And then there was a buy here and a sell there. So that was another whipsaw, but the designer's intent for this was to avoid the diaper change moment. So look what happened next. The Russell imploded 35% over a very short period of time. And the S&P had a very similar type of move. Arthur, I got your setups. We'll, we'll uh, take a look at those in one second. So the, again, the designer's intent was to be able to sleep at night when, when the whole world starts to come unglued. And so far, knock on wood, this system since it's been live and then going back a hundred years in historical testing has gotten you out of every bear market before it started, I kept you out of every bear market going all the way back to the early 1900s. But you can see you avoid that haircut there, and then you catch a nice move higher here, okay? So that's a 33% move higher. So you avoided a 35% haircut. I feel like the the lawyer and my cousin Vitty. Uh, but anyway, you avoided a 35% haircut, and you gained 33%. Now, if you do the math, and I can't really do it in my head, but I'm guessing that a 35% loss takes probably 50 or 60% to make up, make that up. So by avoiding those big losses, now it did come back in this particular case. So you can be, well, David came back. Well, I can promise you it doesn't always come back. And I do remember in, what was it, 2008, the S&P 500 was making 
like 13 year lows okay so let's say you had a toddler and you just got around to start saving for his college when he was a few years old and then all of a sudden it's time for junior to go to college well the market's lower than it was when you put the money in well all the financial guys tell you just put your money in the market you're in for the long term that's college savings and a lot of the times they're right and they could be right for 20 30 years and that's why a lot of these guys have pretty good careers but eventually buy and hold will catch up to you. That's one of the things I can guarantee you. But Dave, aren't you buying and holding the Bitcoin? Well, that's just small nickel and dime stuff. If, if that turns into six figures, then then yeah, I'll throw some money management in there, but I'm not really, that's just S and G's for now. All right, just real quick. I just want to show you one slide real quick. This is a Landry 100. This is something that, again, I did years ago and it was really kind of an amazing thing, but the software I was using was no longer made and it became kind of a pain in the butt to keep up with, with everything else. Plus the market got really choppy and I really couldn't find the stocks to fill it. But right now this thing is on fire and it's been pretty awesome. And I know you want to part of me, but it's been a lot of fun to do this. In fact, I look forward to the end of the day to where I could uh, work all the find new stocks and, and get rid of old ones. And what's cool is like you 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 really see where all the money is flowing in the markets. It's a wonderful exercise. And I would encourage you to, to do something like this on your own too. And last week we were talking about, do you really need 100 stocks? I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't throw too much statistics at it. When it comes to markets, statistics are worthless. I think 74.3% of all people know that. Anyway, so the point being made here is all were bought at brand new highs. Now, again, you don't just want to rush out and buy a market and make a new highs. But if you buy enough of a market making new highs, in this case, it's 100 stocks, then your chances of catching some big winners can work out really, really, really nicely. So you've got 119% here. And that was put on into August. This one here, we're looking at 70%. And it was uh, middle of August here, middle of July. I'm sorry, end of July, middle of August. So, so you can see all these were put on in August. There's one from June. I only go back to the end of May, if memory serves. End of May, early June is when this, when I started this up again. But anyway, it's a, it's a cool thing to do. And here's my magic formula to run this list, there it is. That's the whole formula. In order to make this list, this formula has to equal one. Okay, so it means it's at a new closing high. Now, I do sort this list by historical volatility, which is a formula I can give you. And I, I pick the ones that are a little bit higher in volatility. I start with the high volatility ones and then I work my way down. And usually I like to find stocks that are that are well above 30 or so. But keep in mind, there's gonna that's gonna ebb and flow as the market changes at two dollars it's like buying an indefinite call option yeah so i i hear you brian and and you got to be careful with that kind of thinking but i hear you okay so what brian is saying is let's say a stocks at at low levels and i wouldn't i'd encourage you not to bottom fish okay but if a stock is at low levels and you've got a nice technical analysis type of setup a nice little setup you could you could buy it and sit on it and you could like brian saying a two dollar stock well i'm just going to use a two dollar stock yeah it'd be like buying an option that never expires and i know there's 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 danger in that but i i hear you but just make sure you have some sort of setup i'm getting pop-ups over here i didn't want i don't know what's happening okay uh author we'll get to you setups in just a minute as we get to the charts now uh key, one thing i did think about as i'm going live this 252 number if conditions begin to worsen, I might drop that down as low as like 90, 90 days. The only thing I'm, I'm, I'm not getting, and I realize that with this, this Landry 100 ran off of new closing highs for 52 weeks, is I'm not really picking up the stocks at lower levels. But I had, start, I had recently started adding in a few IPOs, and that's been a lot of fun too, because some of these guys take off. Now, one thing I did want to show you a second ago, and we talked about this last week with this HROW, it had a similar pattern, but I think we got in like right here, and you can see this thing just drifted down for a week or two. In some cases, you buy that, it's like you buy here, and it immediately goes through a sharp correction. 
Now, other times, the next day, it's up another 20 or 30% or something crazy. But yeah, a lot of times you you buy, so to speak, in this list. And, and I'm not actually trading this, although every morning I think wake up thinking about how can I make this work longer term? And uh, maybe when I'm retired or something, this might be the portfolio. I'll just run the Landry 100. Okay, let's take a look at, all right, so there's your formula. 